I absolutely love the book. I'm still reading it, tr you know, truth be told, but I love it. And Amber, you kill me. And Lacey, you kill me too. So let's talk about how this whole thing came about. I think it's so valuable and instructive for 64 year old white ladies like me. And obviously for people to relate with the, the shit that Lacey has to put up with on a daily basis. So Amber, you were approached by a bunch of publishing houses to write a memoir because you are an up and coming, uh, you are, you are killing it. And you decided you were going to do this instead. So what was your thinking about that? We, um, Lacey always texts me when something unbelievable happens to her at work and it's constant. So one time I had, I was like, you know what? I will go talk to the book guy at the agency, even though I am absolutely never going to write a book. So on my way there, Lacey texts me a story and I'm laughing so hard. And then when I get there, I'm like, Hey, what if we just did a book of my sister's stories and he was like, we'll call it, you'll never believe what happened to Lacey. We're definitely doing this. It was off to the races. So you didn't even have to convince them that this was a good idea, that which is pretty amazing, right? Yeah, I was super lucky. So Lacey, when Amber approaches you and says, I want to write a book and I want you to be a second voice in it and I want to tell readers what it has been like for you were you a little trepidatious at all Lacey or did you think yeah let's go for it Amber no not at all because this has been like a running joke in our family and with friends like every time something would happen to me they would say that's going in the book you know I'd be somewhere with Amber and she'd be like that's chapter 12 <laughs> you know it's just years and years we would always say this that's going into the book so when she said we're going to write a book I'm like it's written already. We have everything we need. <laughs> there are a couple of really important things, I think, for readers or listeners to understand before they read the book or that come, that really comes out in the book. And that is both the, the location, the geog geography of, of your guys growing up and also the family dynamics. Um, Amber, you are the youngest of five kids. There are four girls and a boy, right? And it seems to me that you and Lacey have a very special relationship. Can you talk about that as sisters, sort of why this chemistry works so well and really works well on the written page? Well, our family is very, very funny. Each person is funnier than the last. I mean, all this happened to me, but I, I am interchangeable. I could just as easily be Lacey. I could just as easily be Angie. I'm just the person who ended up here. So um, we, because we grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, a lot of these things happened to us. And it, it, you know, back when I used to live there, we would have to have, you know, little meetings where we're like, okay, now the boss has said this. This is how long I've been working here. This is my job title at this place. How do we handle it? You know, it's kind of like a, um, it's a, a decisions by committee when something racist happens at work. And you know, first and foremost, it's always hilarious. And I, I'm sorry, not everything that is racist that happens is hilarious, but a, a, a good number of these things are. When you're in the Ruffin house, it's probably pretty darn funny. Um, so we had already been in the habit of saying, y'all ain't never going to believe this shit. And then we um, regale one another with these insane tales. And it just, it, it's unrelenting because it's Omaha and there is no system to check it. So it's just like out of control and has been since the beginning of time. You, Amber, left Omaha. You went to Chicago. You got into improv. Then you moved to New York. You're a writer for Seth Meyers. And now you have your own show on uh, Peacock. So congratulations on that. I'll ask you about that in a moment. But Lacey, you stayed in Omaha. 
You've you've made your life there. And I I Ted, can you explain or describe and I was telling you all that my mom grew up in Omaha, but I never spent much time there. But but talk about what Omaha is like as a city and and lay the groundwork to help us understand some of the things that you've had to deal with there. So Omaha um is predominantly white. I don't think anybody's surprised by that. We have certain pockets, like a lot of cities do, like South Omaha um, is more um, uh, Hispanic. Uh, North Omaha is uh, predominantly black. So, you know, we have those pockets. and But it's still, even in my neighborhood, which is, which is considered a black neighborhood, I'm the only black person on my street. And I tell people that all the time to give you an understanding of, of how it's like. So... Um, but growing, what was your question? I can't even, <laughs> Gro- growing up no. here. Yeah, I was asking you just to kind of like what it was like, what, what Omaha is like as a city. And, yeah. you know, I think the fact that there's a lot of de facto segregation still and all that, you there, know. There definitely is. And I tell people this, and I was talking to someone the other day when I was saying it, I don't even realize that I've done this. I don't venture out from my little area as much um, anymore. I stay, I live in Benson, which you said you went to Benson High. I live in Benson. I stay well, my mom, in Benson. My mom went to Benson. Yes, your mom, I'm sorry. Your mom went to ben, um, Benson. Um, I stay in my area. And especially now, I, I hate to say his name, but, well, I won't say his name, but our past <laughs> president, he has made things a lot more volatile. And so I won't go out to West Omaha. I will not go to Elkhorn. There are just certain areas because we've just called it Trumpville. So I'm like, I'm not, you, 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 you want to go with your friends to a restaurant? And I go, yeah, I'm not doing that. I, I, we can meet on my side uh, of town, but I just don't feel like dealing with the Make American Great, hat, great Hats, you know, whatever. I, I don't want to deal with that. So the city is still, to me, very much segregated. And I just don't want to deal with racism anymore. And so I do stay in my, I do stay in my area and I know that's sad. And a lot of, some people don't, but I, I definitely do. I like to support my community and we have a very, we have a great tight knit community. North Omaha does. And we have game changers. We have people that are trying to change things. I've gone to protests. We have uh, great leaders in our community that are slowly making changes. We are trying to, you know, to change Omaha. So I don't want people to think it's just this, you know, awful stagnant place. People are trying to change things, but it's slow going for me. It's slow going and it is what it is. Well, tell me what, why did you decide Lacey to stay in Omaha and, and, and why don't you explain to listeners what you're doing in Omaha and, and the kind of work that you're doing? Um, so I, first reason why I'm staying in Omaha is my, most of my family is here. Yes, Amber's in New York, but my mother and father live here. My daughter is here. I have great friends. And again, I, my community, Benson, that I live in, I love it. Wouldn't move. I don't want to move. <laughs> Amber always says, you should come to New York. And I'm like, mm. but I, I, I think I'm staying in Omaha for a while. Um, so I just, I do love the community that I live in. Um, and in the book, I'm working in my community in, in some of those stories, but the people that I'm working with don't represent that community. And that's what, what would make it difficult for me at work. I'm working in North Omaha and there was a meeting about whether the workplace was in North Omaha because it had that bad, sti- of that bad stigma to it. And someone said, oh, well, I really wouldn't say this is North Omaha. And what she was saying was, I don't really think there's that many black people on, you know, in this part of town, so let's not call it North Omaha. So those are the problems um, that we face. And right now, I- I've been working before the book. <laughs> I was working in a retirement home, in a retirement home as a program director. And uh, I mean, as the racism was flowing, I was there. And then, you know, this book took off. And so I'm not, I'm not there anymore. I'm just uh, uh, doing events and things for the books, but I, I may go back. <laughs> I might go back. Tell me a little bit, Amber and Lacey, both of you about the writing process, because you did this during the pandemic. Um, and I love the fact that you use different fonts to represent different voices. I love 
just reading. You guys are so funny. Amber, I love when you say, shut up, Lacey. And Lacey, I love when you say, Amber, you're hard to like. And it's just <laughs> so funny and fun. So how did that work? Did you guys record each other? Did you write emails? Amber, explain that a little bit. We, first off, we wrote down a good portion of the stories. And, you know, it's just how Lacey speaks is hilarious. So then, you know, you're really just remembering and writing it down. So then we got most of the stories written down. And then we went to mom and dad's house and spent like a few days, maybe a week on the couch, just, you know, kind of like storyboarding the book and then putting the stories in different groups and then adding the little in between bits. And that was the most fun because I think when a normal person writes a book, it's quite a process. This was not, it was simply us remembering things that had happened and writing them down. You know, it's, uh, we were very lucky using Lacey's journals. Yes. You use a lot of, obviously, because Amber, you're a comedy writer, and the humor is so effective and so disarming, but also very honest. And you are brutally determined, I think, to let people know that you can laugh at some of these things, but they're not funny. I, I don't, I can't explain it. You just do this really interesting balance of humor and this brutal determination that you, that people shouldn't put up with this shit. Is that an accurate way to describe it? What a perfect way to describe it. Yes. I mean, it, you know, it, it's funny. I, I can't help that. It, it has a, hilariousness of its own that I'm not giving it. It just is funny. But then also we live in a world where these things are constant. So that is unfunny, but these things are happening. So it's funny, you know, it goes round and round, but this is what life is. So how do you want to handle it? You can lay down and cry if you'd like, or it, these things are like quite hilarious. So you can have a bit of a good time. You know, it's both. There is no rule book for how to handle it. But if there was, and we wrote it, it would be laughter. And and Lacey, why do you think, I mean, this book, I think is for all audiences. I think it's for, uh, you know, black people to kind of shake their head in or to to appreciate the commonality of the experience, but it's also obviously for white people to get educated about their implicit bias and cultural conditioning and how they see the world. And, um, and, and, and I'm wondering, Lacey, af having written the book and read the book, why you think this might be a really effective way of basically exposing what it's like for black Americans on a daily, if not hourly basis, but also helping white Americans understand and, and be better. Yeah. And, and you just said it, it's laying out one person's life on a day to day basis. I can tell you two stories about something racist that happened to me and someone might be like, Oh, that's not really racist. And you know, it's only two things that happen to you. But when you read story after story after story after story, um, for white people, it's like, wow, I don't understand how she's going through the day, day after day, dealing with this. And I, you know, I've had phone calls and texts from people that have worked with me that recognized some of the things that happened in this book and was like, wow, did all of this, this happen at the job? Because I remember a couple of them and, and then they kind of realized when I would complain and would say things, I didn't realize, they would say, I didn't realize it was that bad. I want people uh, to have that aha moment. And I think this helps them to be like, right? And I hate to say it, but people are, you know, some people are like, racism is real. <laughs> they didn't believe that it was real. And then after reading this book, they're like, okay, that, that is racism. That's right. And all I really want people to, to do that are reading this book 
uh, for, for white people that are reading this book, if you are doing these things, stop. If you know someone that's doing them, give them the book. Tell them to stop. It's, it, it, it is educating. It's like a what not to do. Didn't Amber, we say it one time, we should have told, we should have named this book, Don't Do That. <laughs> Don't stop do that. that. Don't do that. Cut it out. It's a how to not to act at work. And I think, you know, I think it's very impressive, Lacey, that you have been on it. I mean, you have been not only calling out this stuff, I think in a, in a really effective way. So in a way, putting it on paper for everyone to read, it must be, feel very validating for you in some ways, Lacey, right? Because, you know, I'm sure there are times when you're like, well, should I do this? Should I not? You have to constantly balance. Is this going to hurt me professionally? You know, how much can I speak up? Are they going to, you know, think I'm an angry black woman? All those things, all those calculations you have to make constantly. So I think this must feel, as I said, incredibly validating. Like, yes, this happened. And Amber, you must feel very proud of Lacey. She's fine. <laughs> No, I am proud. It is just, it is like Lacey said, once you see the st- the sheer volume, the sheer volume of these stories, it is quite something. And then you're forced to look back and go, how did this human being survive this? <laughs> but she did look at her, fine as ever. <laughs> And, yeah. and, you know, I want to talk about intersectionality in a minute, um, because I think that was an interesting uh, theme in the book that you don't actually talk about specifically, Amber, but I want to talk about it in a moment, because just as a woman, I related to a lot of the things. Obviously, I'm not a black woman, but just in terms of how you describe Lacey and why people seem to feel empowered to say some of these things. But first, I want to get to some of the funny stuff that you guys talk about. And the very first story is really funny. And I know you kind of say you, you kind of don't save the best for last. You are right out of the gate, Amber, with a funny story. And Lacey or Amber, either one, I wondered if you could tell that story. Yes. Lacey had Black History Month Uh, black history checks and each check had a different historical black figure on it so once Lacey is paying for something and she writes out the check she hands it to the cashier the cashier takes the check and goes oh my gosh I didn't realize you could get your own picture on your checks the picture on her check was a picture of Harriet Tubman (laughs) the cashier a did not know who Harriet Tubman is b thought Lacey was Harriet Tubman and see couldn't tell that it's like literally the oldest picture on earth (laughs) what did you say to the cashier Lacey I said that's Harriet Tubman and she just goes hmm okay didn't she didn't know who it was and I didn't have time to do a history lesson at that point I would have loved to but you know we got to keep the line moving I just was in shock and things don't shock me that much, but that shocked me. <laughs> <laughs> you have some very funny pictures too, Amber, in the book of all the black women you've been told you look like, which is so funny. And you basically mimic their pose and their hairstyle, whether it's Condoleezza Rice or, I mean, uh, who else? Oprah. Oprah. So talk about that and why you did that. We just knew it was going to be uh, hilarious. <laughs> and that was Amber's idea. Amber said, I think we should take some pictures. And I was like, sure, I'm all for it. I, you know, we just thought it was a great idea. Amber, why'd you choose it? Lacey loves a photo shoot. So <laughs> Lacey true. demanded that we take a thousand pictures of her trying to look like her favorite celebrities and put it in the book. No, it's just, I think saying you look like A, B, and C is not enough. You have to look at a picture of Lacey's face next to these people and then say, does she look like them or 
have you only seen two black people and to you they look alike you know but and I every thought once I, in a while like we i thought we I took did a good all those job pictures too. and we thought it was hilarious you did a good job you, looked you good. did i did a good but job. some of them she looks like them like that radon chong you look like radon chong dude <laughs> <laughs> my daughter was my makeup stylist yeah well, it was very funny. And you guys, it, sort of along those lines, you're going to read uh, a section for us uh, from the book, page 101, where you start. Uh, this is a section of the book that really deals with this, Amber and Lacey. And you all have agreed that you would, would read it for our listeners. Here is an excerpt from the hit book. <laughs> You'll never believe what happened to Lacey. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Amber. <laughs> Commence. Lacey was at a director's meeting, and everyone was acting really strange whenever they mentioned the new co-worker starting that day. Lacey immediately knew she must be a person of color because they all kept asking her if she had seen her yet. She had not. They were dying to tell her but didn't know the right way to do it. During the meeting, one of the directors could not take it anymore, and finally she blurted out... There will be another colored gal working here, Lacey. She was just so excited to tell her that she couldn't hold it in. Lacey had to give a history lesson on how we don't use the word colored anymore. <laughs> My new coworker and I had one thing in common. We were black. Once she started, the staff and the residents at the retirement home could not tell us apart. Every day, they would mistake us for each other. And I'm not in any way exaggerating. I'm a good 15 years older. She's 15 years older than me, too. Shut up. I have natural long locks, and she has bone straight shorter hair. I was in a meeting with my boss for 32 minutes. 32 minutes. When the meeting was over, she said to me, now send Lacey in because I'm supposed to meet with her soon. I said, I am Lacey. And we sat in silence, and then she apologized. I gave a lesson on how not being able to tell black people apart is racist. <laughs> The so the book is full of stories like that. Very well done. Well done, ladies. Uh, very good dramatic reading. Um, <laughs> but how do you, I mean, how do you deal with that? And how do you deal with people's ignorance? Because I think they're probably well-meaning people who don't quite appreciate the level of ignorance in their comments. And I know that it's interesting, Amber, you talked about, and I was actually having this conversation the other day with some friends of mine, because I, I did a documentary on, on transgender people, and I interviewed Gavin Grimm, who is in Southern Virginia and wanted to use the, the men's bathroom, transgender male. And he said, you know, I don't feel like I should be teaching people about the transgender experience. And at first I was kind of like, well, if people genuinely want to learn and understand. And he said, well, that's why God invented Google. And I'm curious about that because it seems like, uh, obviously, and, and then I started thinking about it, and after a while, you know, to have to kind of explain it over and over and over again to people who don't understand is, is it becomes very demeaning for people. But I thought it was interesting, Amber, you basically said, full stop, you are not here to teach white people how to behave. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that, because... I think it's something for that that has taken me a bit to understand, but I think that our listeners would benefit from from your explaining that. Yeah, it is this. I am not dragging white people into the light anymore. I lived in Omaha, Nebraska. I did it. I don't I'm not great at it. I don't love doing it. It does have an effect on you. I before everything, protect my own happiness. And it cannot thrive when I'm convincing people that I am of any value. So I don't do it anymore. And there are so many resources now that I think people can figure it out. 
what's more is everything has kind of gotten worse because we're now all slowly becoming aware of the fact that racism is a thing. So it's becoming a thing you can just feel free to talk to me about, even though for white people, it's not a, it's not a thing connected to any actual pain, but for me it is. And so for people giving me invitations to slog through my pain, for their uh, um, enjoyment, amusement, understanding, um, learning, I'm just not going to do that. Lace, Lacey has and, a different Lace, take. Yeah. I, yeah, Lacey, go ahead. I wish I could do that. Uh, <laughs> but sometimes when you, and, and I, when I tell you I used to do it every single time someone said something, every single job I had, I had a speech prepared when someone used to say something. I, 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 I don't do it as much anymore, but sometimes just for the sake of other uh, black people that work with me that would never speak up, I'll give the, the history lesson. And then you look in the room and you see maybe not even half are getting what you're saying anyway, or even buying it. You know, they're like, really? And after you've given this 15 minute speech and you're mad and you think you might cry and you, and you might walk out of work to go through all of that. And still uh, they would need, you know, 10 classes to understand, you know, why we don't say Negro anymore. And all these, ter I mean, seriously, it, 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 it does, um, it takes a toll on you, but I'm still, I still will teach people. I, I still do that. I, I don't do it as much, but I wish I could just walk away and be like, I can't, I don't have time. Google it. <laughs> can't do it all the time. You know, I, 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 I totally hear you guys. And I'm wondering, and I want to, I want to get back to some of the funny stories, but obviously this is such an important topic and, 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 it would get very old and exhausting and and hurtful to have to kind of do this on a regular basis but you know how can we how can we help come up with the solution do you think a lot of it is is the way i mean a lot of it is proximity that brian stevenson i think talks about so eloquently you know the fact that that we're still very segregated but also what about what about education is there some help in how how our our kids are being educated what they're learning how they're learning it because i think that you know is such a, a an important aspect to to getting to a place of of deeper understanding and appreciation and and less less racism, sexism, all the isms. What do you think, Lacey? Uh, education does play a big part of it. And uh, just, the, just the other day uh, on the news in uh, one of these small towns in Nebraska, uh, they just uh, had a story about how they kept, uh, you, you could choose whether you wanted your child to take a black history course. Where do, where do you go from that? And you know, most of the parents are probably like, absolutely not. So history is a big thing. Our history is not taught. Um, racism is not taught in schools and white children aren't learning that at all. So I don't, people have asked me this question, Katie, and I don't, this is where I fail. I don't know how to change things. I don't know how to make white people more educated. I don't know how to make, they have to want to, they have to want to care. First of all, how do you do that? I don't, I don't have the answers for that at all. I don't know how to make it better um, and change things. And that's, I feel sad when I say that, but I'm living in, I feel at sometimes 1865. I don't know how to, how to begin to get out of that. It is through education, but if you have people that don't want to learn about your history or don't want to learn about your value, I, I don't know where to go from that. Amber, I know that you use your show, you use your writing on Seth's show, uh, to kind of address some of these, uh, uh, you know, racism and these insane things that, that Lacey has to put up with on a regular basis and so many black Americans do, but, but how do we start changing things, Amber, in your view? Obviously you do it, I think, as I mentioned earlier, through humor, through 
like making it uh, humor is kind of the gateway drug for talking about racism in some ways, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, I do think I I'm sure there are a lot of people with a lot of great ideas on a way forward. Personally, I think we are lost. Everyone who is 30 and up, it's over. This is it. This is who the world is. There is no hope. <laughs> but try to find a bunch of people who are kind to you, the end. But I do think that um, what we need to do, like there is a path forward. We're just not going to really benefit from it. Um, all of the textbooks in America are wrong and not like, they hide black history. They hide white history. The history books are literally very wrong. And they paint a picture of a country that has taken care of its uh, black community. But in, um, in spite of that, the black community has done wrong by themselves. And that's not, that's absolutely not what happened, but that is the narrative we are taught in school. So I think if you learn that, no wonder when you hear Black Lives Matter, you go, hey, I don't like this. Or why do you feel like you've been uh, shifted, you know? So uh, it's the school system. It is every book in every elementary school is literally wrong and needs to be thrown in the garbage. So as soon as someone has the guts to do that. I, I totally agree. You know, I did I did a, a documentary on Confederate statues because nobody really understood the lost cause. They didn't understand when these statues were put up after Brown v. Board of Education, what happened. And I think that is so true. And Black History Month, I find increasingly insulting to every Black person in this country. And I know you did a very funny bit the other night on your show about why we need white history month <laughs> talk tell us about that amber and and is did that come from your uh you know appreciation that that everybody's learning things that are just not yes um yes it's a it's a lot of what i just said i don't think i think people love to I feel superior to black people. It, it feels good and it feels comforting. I mean, I would know, I'm just assuming here, but I, I think that when people get mad at the fact that there is a black history month, then, you know, it's a lot of that um, yummy feeling of superiority, but they also just have not been taught the truth, you know, and that's really sad. And you can look back and you can pinpoint exactly how it happened. It happened with, um, what's it called? The Daughters of the American Revolution. Who are those children? The, the, the crazy old women. That's what they should be called. Crazy old women. Um, and they uh, literally went in and they changed, um, they uh, or c created a, a narrative for what has happened in America. And they be became so powerful that, you know, they, uh, in order to create a textbook, you had to run it by them. And if they didn't like it, then that textbook didn't get made. And those are the textbooks we are still all learning from today. Today, a child is going to put down a book that was helped uh, written by those women and then go out and march at a protest today. So it, it's it's insane that those women who, you know, whose only goal is to make it okay to um that people were in a confederacy that they that people were a part of the confederacy you know to honor yeah. their grandfathers and stuff dude it's wild <laughs> it's yeah i think you're yeah the daughters of the confederacy and and sort of perpetuating the lost cause narrative not not to mention the fact that texas because they're the largest purchaser of text of textbooks in the country they have a disproportionate say in how stories are told in those textbooks which i think is is something that people don't really recognize or realize um i know you guys are almost out of time but having written this book what is the reception 
What kind of reception are you all getting to this book? Amber, you first. Um, I am getting a lot of thumbs up, but I mean, people are mostly like, I cannot believe this. And it, it makes me feel good because I think we named the book correctly. <laughs> I, but I do think people are like, I'm shocked. I'm shocked that all this happened to one little tiny person. And I'm like, that's exactly the way I want you to feel. I want you to feel shocked at the sheer volume of this stuff. The volume. The sheer volume, as you write it in one place in the book. And Lacey, what what about you? I'm curious, have you, I know you mentioned this, but have you had coworkers call? Have they said, geez, Lacey, this is so embarrassing. I'm so humiliated and I want to do better. I mean, what are you hearing? No, I still have not gotten one negative message. Why did you write this? But I've only had one question where a woman said, you know, I was reading this book and I thought it was me, but no, that, that wasn't me. And I said, no, no, that was you. You did that. <laughs> and then we had a nice little talk and she was fine. She was like, okay, apologized, moved on. I have had nothing but positive messages. I love the book. I can't believe all this was happening to you. Uh, we were working together. I didn't know. I didn't see it. And I, I understand what you were talking about better in all those meetings and at work. I understand why you would get upset about this and that. I have not had one angry text or phone call. I mean, it still could come and I'm ready for it. I haven't blocked any phone. I, I tell people I haven't blocked anybody's phone, you know, any, any numbers or anything like that. So if they want to call me, they can. Um, you did the behavior so I can, I can write about it. I don't have any problem with that at all. But no, I have not gotten anything negative yet. See? Which is great. Yeah. And it is so damn funny. And because I mentioned it, can I ask you one question about intersectionality? A term that I learned like five years ago from my daughter. Um, but I'll, I found it interesting, Amber, you talk about uh, characteristics of Lacey that have nothing to do with her race, but it's about that she's petite and pretty. And I'm curious if you think about this intersection of gender and race in Lacey's case and how, how that plays into some of the things that are said to her, if they're, if they're a combination, a weird combination of both of these things. They de it definitely is. I think people feel brave when they talk to a black person. They feel brave when they talk to a woman, but they feel super brave when they talk to a woman whose ass they think they can beat. <laughs> that's, that's Lacey. She's so tiny. But the shocker is L Lacey could friggin' lift a car. She's a bodybuilder. So each one of those people is hilariously wrong. Um, but, you know, I'm like, I, it gets bigger every time I say it. I'm like a foot taller than Lacey. It's probably like four inches, but I'm like a lot bigger than, I'm a lot bigger than Lacey. And people don't say those crazy things to me that they would say to Lacey, <laughs> but they can take me. <laughs> they can't take Lacey. <laughs> but no, it's just Would you double. think about that too, Lacey? And did that inspire you to become a bodybuilder? Uh, no, I had just had a baby and I felt fat. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to get into shape. And I was like, how can I get into shape the fastest way? And I've always like liked the physique and all that. So um, that's why I, I started uh, weightlifting. But um, no, I definitely uh, can tell if I'm, you know, I'm 5'2". So I feel like that's just, people just think they can say and do whatever because you're just a small lady. Yeah. 100%. Well, I'm the same height you are. Yeah. And there's actually a lot of research about I'm well, I, I always say I'm five, three and three quarters, I think on a good day, I'm five, three, maybe. But it is interesting. There's actual research about the role height plays in how people relate to you and the level of respect they give you. So I'm going to send you guys some of that stuff because I think that's really interesting. Well, I know we're out of time. And I love the book and I want to hang out with you, you two at some point when this pandemic is over, because, um, you know, it's, it's, it's both heartbreaking and hilarious. And to be able to pull that off is really, 
really quite a feat. So Amber and, and Lacey, the book is called You'll Never Believe What Happened to Lacey, Crazy Stories About Racism. Thank you guys so much for making some time for me on our podcast. And by the way, you all should do a podcast together. You would be, this would be such a fun podcast. It's That's truly a great would. idea. Amber, get on that. I mean, we're on FaceTime friggin' 15 <laughs> minutes every day. You might as well. Might as well make it a podcast. It would be really fun. Good idea, I think you, you know, look into that. My new manager. And then, and then when your podcast launches, I can have you on again. Yay! Yay. Thank you, deal. Katie. Thank you, Katie Craig. It's been wonderful. Mm -hmm. All right. Bye. Bye, girls. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.